I, I want to talk about, so a year ago, mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> I was yesterday years old when I actually learned about this, but a year ago, the Surgeon General raised this alarm that there's a public health crisis of loneliness, isolation, and lack of connection, which, mm -hmm. I mean, you just have to turn on the news to know that, but okay. And your research focuses so much on social and emotional development in children. So have you found that kids' social and emotional development really took a hit and as part of this conversation of isolation, disconnection, loneliness that the Surgeon General is discussing? Yeah, it's such a good question. I've actually never measured loneliness directly as the sort of um, deficit perspective on like what negative things may going on, may be going on. Um, but instead, in my work, I've really been focusing on communication, collaboration, empathy, um, ensemble building, right? These ideas of, well, what is the opposite of loneliness, right? What is, what is the, what is the, the resilience that we can build with kids in order to not have them fall into this negative space of isolation or loneliness or feelings of disconnection from others? And I think from a sort of social and emotional learning perspective, the more we can work with kids to in enable and uncover the sort of natural connections that kids know how to make with others and the natural ways in which they know how to come into community and they know how to come into collaboration with each other. The more we can provide space for that and um, allow for that to occur uh, in a, in a non-judgmental sort of non-inhibited way, the better off we're going to be. So my work on theater education and on the sort of cognitive, social, and emotional effects of being involved in theater has really been focused in two parts. One is, well, what is the environment that a theater classroom or a rehearsal space sets up for kids that then enables them to practice, integrate, use, and foster all of these really critical social and emotional skills? And then because I'm a scientist, right, and because what I'm interested in is trying to get to what is universal, what is fundamental, what is the scaffolding that we build our cultural practices on top of, what I've been looking at is which skills are actually being used in these classrooms and, and how are these skills being used in these classrooms? Because if we're going to look for effects and we're going to be able to look for outcomes that are positive, we need to know the specificities of what it is that we're looking for. So the term social and emotional skills or social and emotional learning tends to be used quite broadly and very, very inclusively of everything from, you know, being nice to your peers to understanding and knowing your own emotional state in a moment. And those are two very different sets of skills, even though they are under this broad umbrella. So I've really been focused on what are the qualities of a theater space, a theater classroom, a rehearsal space for kids, and then what specifically is it that they're engaging in that we can then promote and foster in order to help them build these critical social and emotional 21st century skills. And that's really what my, my work has found is those two qualities. Well, and, and I love that you're talking about these social emotional skills um, and, and translating the theater space to truly the real world, because that's what learning is. And, and I was, it, it's funny, but over the last few weeks, I keep hearing this term soft skills. And so I think what we're talking about really is these soft skills. So how does, I, I guess first, can you help define what people are talking about when they talk about soft skills sure. and then how theater helps um, build upon those soft skills? 
Yeah, my, my joke is sort of, they're the soft skills, but they're the hardest to teach, hardest to define, hardest to foster, hardest to understand. You know, when we talk about soft skills, it's really a term that's used only in contrast with the idea of hard skills, right? So hard skills, um, I like to think of them not as more difficult, but hard skills, meaning they're like firm. You can understand what they are quite clearly. So being able to add and subtract and multiply and divide, being able to understand how the periodic table works, being able to understand the rules of physics or the rules of uh, English language and how you use grammar, those are hard skills because they they are definitive, right? They are, um, they're, they're almost like a solid, right? Like, you know how math works because it works the same no matter what context you're in. Um, two plus two is going to equal four everywhere in the world. Um, actually, that's not true. There are places in the world where two plus two equals many, right? Because there are some cultures and some languages that don't really have like a mathematics culture that goes above four, but those are rarer and rarer at this point. But when you put two objects and two objects in a pile together, you're going to get four objects no matter where you are universally. There you go. So that makes those skills and that knowledge hard, hard in the fact that like solids are hard, right? Like a block of something is hard. Soft skills are the ones that need to be adaptable, changeable, context dependent, situation dependent, and person dependent. So something like understanding what somebody else is feeling. So this is a term that, this is a skill that we might call um, affective empathy, I'm sorry, Affective theory of mind or cognitive empathy. Those terms are kind of the same thing in a psychologist's like toolkit. Um, and that is understanding what it is that you're feeling in any particular moment. In lay language, in everyday speech, we might call that empathy, right? I understand what you're feeling. But for psychologists, um, understanding what you're feeling is a cognitive process, meaning a thinking process. Feeling what you're feeling is an emotional process, but they're intimately tied with one or another, right? Because if you don't understand what somebody's feeling, it's kind of hard to feel what they're feeling. And if you have sort of an automatic reaction to someone else's emotions, it's helpful to understand why that's happening. So understanding someone else's feelings and feeling someone else's feelings are, are these empathic processes. However, these are soft, I think of these as soft processes in the way that you might think of liquid or gas as filling the container that you put it into. Because that's empathy is different depending on who it is you're interacting with because there are other factors at play there. Are you a child interacting with your parent? Well, then your parent shouldn't expect you to have the same level of empathy for them as they have for you. Are you a peer-to-peer -peer relationship? Well, the closeness of your friendship is going to determine how well you know that other person's moods, right? We know when something's wrong with our close friends, even if they're sort of not saying, I'm feeling very sad right now. But if you're meeting somebody for the first time, and you may not know their facial expressions, their body expressions, their personality, you may need to sort of take a second and go, I don't know this person well enough. They might be feeling sad, or they might just be a little bored. But if it's like your best friend or your sister, you can kind of tell the difference between feeling sad and feeling bored, right? So that's what makes these skills softer. It's not that they're easier by any means. In most respects, in many respects, they're more difficult. But they're softer because they need to be flexible to, you know, let's say you're in a school classroom. Your emotional regulation in that school classroom is going to be different than if you're out on a Friday night at dinner with your family, which is going to be different than if you are uh, sitting in the audience of a theater, right? And the ways in which we have cultural norms to express emotions, to control our emotions, to connect with our emotions, those are also different, not just in contexts, but across cultures. So the norms of 
you know, how much emotion you're allowed to show in a theater is different if you're at, say, a rock performance, right? You're like at a club, like at a band where you're allowed to like scream and clap um, versus if you go see something like Hamilton, where when you're going and sitting in that theater, the norms of the theater, you're not supposed to be singing along with that show. Like, I know you know the music really well, but you're supposed to be quiet. And then let's say you go to another culture that you're not familiar with and you go and sit in an audience there. You need to learn the rules of that culture in order to know how to regulate, express and understand your own emotions. So soft skills are the ones that are variable and that take time and cultural understanding in order to build. I have not answered the second part of your question, which is how is that related to theater? Well, and, and how does what we teach in the theater classroom um, or in the play environment, because not all schools have theater necessarily, sure. um, how does that translate to not just, well, I, I'll ask I'll ask it this way to teaching these soft skills. And then the second part of this question is for you as a psychologist to measure how the soft skills, because that that's a whole different conversation. So we'll get into that a little bit in a little bit. But yeah, how, how did the um, how does the arts teacher, how does what's happening in the theater arts classroom teach these soft skills? Yeah, so I have a few different hypotheses that are built off of previous research in my lab, but not directly tested yet. Um, one is that the theater classroom is uh, has two really important qualities to it that are not replicated almost anywhere else in the educational curriculum. The first is that the theater classroom is embodied and the second is that it's contained. And what I mean by that is that the theater classroom um, requires, asks of its students to use their bodies to express both themselves and their characters. So when you are in a theater classroom, you are asked to express all sorts of words, ideas, emotions, desires, beliefs, intentions, subtext, right? You're asked to express all of these things physically with your body, right? Theater is an embodied art form and it's an embodied art form with narrative on it. So other art forms are also embodied, right? You're, you're physicalizing with paint or sculpture, you're physicalizing with dance and other art forms are also narrative, right? You're writing poetry, you're telling a story with music. However, only theater has both like the use of the body and the use of a story. And so I think that is really um, a laboratory for real life, because in real life, we're constantly looking for cause and effect. We're constantly looking for arc. We're looking for beginnings and endings. And we are embodied creatures, right? We are out walking around in the world, interacting with other people. Um, this is part of the reason why being on Zoom all day feels so bad, because you're not involving your body over time. The other factor about the um, theater space is that it is contained. So this is supported by a good amount of evidence in my book that's coming out in July, which is that when students enter into a theater space, they begin their theater time, usually with a moment of preparation. This can be physical warm up. It can be uh, meditation. It can be a sit down discussion, a reflection on what they've been through outside of the theater classroom. Um, they have to leave their backpacks at the door. Um, they are asked to come often into a neutral space or a blank space in their bodies. And what that does is it sets up a contained space for these students where they don't have to still be concerned with the world outside them. They are invited to sort of reflect on it and prepare for something new. There's not a continuation from their outside life to their inside life. And what this does is it sets up a sense of safety. 
that all of the other theater uh, activities are then poured into. So when students are asked to be playful in a theater classroom and like invent animal characters to walk around in, the safety of that space and the containment of that space lets them be exploratory, lets them release some inhibitions and be playful. And then the theater space is often closed out. And this, again, I've got found lots of evidence for this in my book, that the theater space is closed out with a moment of reflection or a moment of like ending. And so you have this almost ritualized classroom experience. And I know that this is also like rehearsal experiences are like this, performance experiences are like this, where you enter into something and then you exit from something. And the boundary conditions of that allow for this real sense of like consequence-free, mistake-making, trying new stuff, being flexible, trying to commit to a choice. And then if it doesn't work, you move on to something else. And those two things, right, the embodied practice of theater and then the contained space of theater allow students to try on other people's emotions, try on a context that you might not otherwise be in, like practicing a scene that takes place in a police station. Try on this idea of weird language that you might mess up, but then your friends are also messing up. And so you're trying to find connection through Shakespearean language or through heightened speech that's translated from ancient Greek, right? So the, the space itself encourages this sense of emotional knowledge, uh, emotional connection, emotional understanding. And then on top of that, there's the we're all in this togetherness of it, right? And I don't think that's necessarily unique to the theater classroom, right? There is a sense of we're all in this together. This is why people love sports, right? And going on to sports teams when you're playing in an orchestra, certainly like you really have to be an ensemble with the other members of your musical group. So theater also has that groupiness, right? Theater also has that sense of um, we're going to collaborate. We have to learn how to communicate. We have to learn how to work together towards a goal. But then you do that within this embodied space and you do that within this safe contained space and you just can't get anything like it anywhere else. I love that. So how do you as a psychologist now go into these classrooms or into these environments and measure the effects of um, play and theater games and rehearsal, um, how, how do you measure that? Yeah, this is this is the question of my life, right? How do you <laughs> something that is so complex and so individualistic, right? Because those are those are two truths about the arts, and they're two truths about theater specifically, which is that um, a theater classroom is not one thing. Um, a theater classroom is many, many, many different things, right? And and the label you put on it is it an improv class? It is a scene study class? Is it a rehearsal class? Are we uh, just learning how to act for the very first time, or are we doing like advanced, you know, uh, really devised improvised? work that we're trying to get a message across about a particular political idea that we're trying to explore through our work, right? So a theater class is not all one thing. Uh, it's deeply complex. It's also deeply individualized because a theater classroom for a group of students who are growing up um, in a dangerous neighborhood under conditions of marginalization are going to approach this idea of self-expression through the arts very differently than a group of students who are growing growing up with privilege and sort of in a safe and relatively wealthy school district. Um, so I've approached the question of measurement in order to get through all of this in a few different ways. So the first way that I approach this is from a naturalistic, observational, qualitative perspective. And those are really big words to basically mean I go and I'm in the classroom and I see what's happening with my psychologist's viewpoint, right? With my training in developmental psychology and all of the different 
elements of social and emotional and cognitive and neurological development that I know happen in an adolescent age group, I go into that theater classroom and I see, well, what is it that the acting teachers are talking about? And what is what are the exercises that they're giving to these adolescents to perform or to do? And how are those related back to different kinds of psychological constructs? So that kind of naturalistic observation uh, is what I did for the book. And then what we did was we looked using a qualitative theory called or a qualitative methodology called grounded theory analysis. Basically what that is, is you look at the data in its most raw form. So in its most unprocessed, unadulterated form. So I had 56 hours of film. I had 56 hours of film of these acting classes from all of these different school districts. And I just watched them over and over and over and over again until patterns began to emerge. So one of the first patterns that emerged is that every kind of activity that's in an acting class falls under one of four different kinds. So there are preparation activities where they're warming up. There are generation activities where they're creating text and movement. There are interpretation activities where they're taking scripts or characters and interpreting them in their own ways. And then there are reflection activities where they are reflecting back, thinking about and engaging in metacognition over the activities. So every activity fell under one of those four categories, which emerged naturally from watching those videos. And then as I was looking for these social and emotional skills, I had a perspective where I was looking for broad based teaching strategies and broad based learning strategies that the students were engaging in, rather than looking for that super narrow definition of what a developmental psychologist might be able to operationalize and measure as I'm only looking at cognitive empathy, because lots of different real world behaviors could use and integrate cognitive empathy. Instead, what I was looking for was, well, what are the teachers trying to teach? What is coming out of the statements that they're making? And so from there, there were these different habits of mind, which are approaches to problem solving and approaches to tasks and um, questions that the teachers are putting forward that the students have to use. These habits of mind are, are sort of strategies that they use in order to solve the problems in the classroom. So that's one end of a continuum, right? That is really based in the classroom, really based on the data, um, the raw data as it emerges. On the other side of the scientific continuum are randomized control trials, right? Blinded, double-blinded randomized control trials. And that is what we hear about when we hear about medical trials, right? When you are testing the efficacy of a new pill, you the doctor doesn't know what pill the patient is taking, the patient doesn't know what pill they're taking, and then you measure what happens as a result of taking this pill. And some people are taking the real pill, and some people are taking a placebo pill, and some people are taking something else, um, and, and you do it that way. So to use that kind of methodology, you have to go with much younger children who don't have preconceived notions about what theater is, or what it does, or why it works. And you have to have people who are delivering theater who also are not aware of what kind of outcomes we talk about. Now, there's definitely an argument to be made that when you do something like a randomized control trial, you can't possibly be doing theater, right? You're doing something else. You're doing something theater adjacent. And so I don't want to claim that the randomized control trials we've done in my lab group are that I'm doing theater in the way that like an acting teacher would come in and like create classroom environment and stuff like that, because we we definitely were researchers coming in and doing it. That being said, um, I conducted a study a few years ago and published a few papers showing that for five year old children, when they are randomly assigned to do an eight week curriculum of dramatic pretend play games. So these are viola spolin, creative curriculum, sort of theater based games for very young children. When they are taught those games by research assistants, not even theater teachers, and then we test them before they start taking the games and after they finish taking the game, and we compare them to other kids who have done eight weeks of either um, blocks and building with blocks uh, through an intervention or eight weeks of listening to stories um, and engaging with questions around those stories. 
The kids who are in the dramatic pretend play games are getting better at their emotional control and regulation over the course of those eight weeks, above and beyond the kids who are doing block play or story time. And what we were able to show in that randomized control trial is that those kids in the dramatic pretend play games were uniquely getting this combination of physicalization and narrative. Because the kids in the block play were physicalizing their block play, but not doing any narrative. And the kids who were in story time were getting lots and lots of narrative, but they were sitting still while listening to those stories. So something about this combination of physicalization and narrative affected kids' emotional control over the course of eight weeks, 12 hours of this um, dramatic pretend play game intervention. So that was a randomized control trial. And then there's a bunch of stuff in the middle, right, of this continuum of scientific rigor. In that randomized control trial, we used validated, reliable, standard psychological measurement of emotional control for this age group, right? There's a huge sort of body of research dating back at least 75 years, let's say, at this point of how to test things like empathy, theory of mind, uh, emotional regulation, emotional control, peer relationships um, across a variety of different age groups. And so if what you're interested in is the standardization of the measurement, then you can look to expertise that already exists in developmental psychology, in cognitive science, in social psychology. The question is whether what you're measuring is actually what is being taught in these classrooms. So in the in-between, right, between these randomized control trials where you're using standardized measurements of self-concept or standardized measurements of, you know, emotional control, is this world of quasi-experimental or correlational or other ways of designing a research study where you have maybe a little more flexibility for how realistic the activity is but a little less ability to say something definitive about outcomes. And from my perspective, every little study that goes into this question is just one piece of a puzzle that we build the whole picture of what theater does in education settings and for everyone out of putting all of the pieces together of this puzzle. I love, I love that I love that you're diving into this because truly the correlation between arts and science and arts and psychology is really a, a new, a new, a new area of study, mm -hmm. um, which I love. Uh, do you have any findings in your research that surprised you? Um, I will say the when I went in and watched the theater classrooms, the biggest surprise was how much time was spent on preparation activities and how little time was spent on sort of more traditional scene study preparation for performance. Because I think there is this popularized notion that the whole goal is always to put on a full-scale production, you know, a two-hour play with a first act and a second act, and you start and you finish. And, and that's the sort of like old school perspective on what theater is for, right? Theater is to create the school play and everybody gets together and they learn the music and they learn the lines and then they rehearse and rehearse and then they go and perform. But actually, an acting class is way more variable than that. Um, and in every classroom we were in, at least half of the time was spent not in those activities. So there was always this preparation, this warm-up period of discussion and physicalization. And then often teachers would spend the rest of the time on improv and generation activities and just kind of playing different kinds of games, always tying it back to, okay, and then when you're going to play a character, you need to be thinking about this skill that we're building right now. Or, you know, when, when you're uh, getting a script for the first time, this kind of playful analysis would be appropriate for script analysis as well. But I was surprised by how little, like, performance of scripted characters was actually done in a lot of these classrooms. 
fascinating. And I, I guess for, for, you know, there might be parents out there, there might be teachers out there listening to what we're talking about saying, well, we don't have a theater program. We don't have a theater, you know, or, or, or a homeschool parent who doesn't even have access to the theater classroom. So how do we apply what we now know through your research to these outside environments, outside the classroom, outside the traditional classroom, I should say. Yeah, that's such a great question. So I think there's a few different answers. Um, the first answer is actually there is a uh, like really strong field of teaching and curriculum uh, that is integrative. Right. And these are called drama based pedagogies. And um, I'm going to shout out Catherine Dawson, who uh, has written a great book called Drama Based Pedagogies. Um, and that book is sort of both an explanation of what they are and then a bit of a workbook uh, for different kinds of exercises and ways to use theater skills and techniques integrated into a social studies lesson or integrated into a physical sciences lesson or integrated into a history lesson, for example. Um, and that is one way that if there's not a theater program in the school or if a parent is looking for ways to um, have theater be integrated into um, their classroom kinds of activities, that's one way to do it. But the other way to do it is to forget this idea that theater is supposed to be um, used for anything else at all. Uh, because I will say that one thing that I always want to be careful of is that theater does not become a Trojan horse for other kinds of outcomes, because that's not why we do theater in the first place, right? The reason theater exists is not because it makes us better at empathy. The reason theater exists is because people are motivated to listen to stories and tell stories. Empathy happens to come along with that, right? Emotional understanding happens to come along with that. But the quickest way to kill somebody's inherent love of an activity is to say, we will now do our 30 minutes of theater for emotional control exercises, right? <laughs> this is why, I mean, it's a great metaphor actually for, um, it's always more fun to go run around a soccer field and kick a soccer ball with some friends than it is to go out and run 10 laps, right? And there maybe there are people out there who love running laps and I'm so jealous because I hate it. But I, you know, if you're going to get me out to like kick a soccer ball around, I'll get some sneaky steps in there and some, some sneaky exercise in there. But I'm doing it because it's fun to play with my friends, right? So I think for theater at, for its own sake, right, um, it's a really sort of easy thing to do to grab four random items from around your house and sit down with your child and say, if we were going to make up a play using these four items, what play would we make up, right? If we were going to um, pretend to walk on the moon, what would that walk look like? Well, what if we were gonna walk through molasses? What would that walk look like? And what if we were gonna walk like we were elephants? What would that walk look like? For very young children, right? For kids maybe under the age of eight, they don't need to be encouraged much more than that, right? Because pretend play is a universal, natural, developmental, um, activity in neurotypical kids. And so an invitation to engage in pretend play is often all children need. And the line from theatrical activity to pretend play is a relatively porous one, right? The, you know, what is a pretend play activity? What is a theatrical activity? I think I, I know some actors who would claim it's all one and the same. Um, and certainly there are many similar qualities to them. So I think for the, you know, for the teacher or parent who wants to have theater in their child's life and isn't quite sure where to start, start with thinking about what kinds of pretend play games you used to play, right? What kinds of dress up games did you used to play? Could you figure out a way to recreate your child's favorite um, television story uh, using items around the house? Um, 
Could you think about different ways to um, put characters or emotions on everyday activities, right? So let's clean up the room, but let's clean up the room pretending we're robots. Let's clean up the room, but pretending that we are um, like uh, running away from home. And so we have to get everything as quickly as possible. Let's clean up the room, but let's pretend we're ghosts. So we're trying to move things without anybody noticing. Uh, let's clean up the room, but pretend that we are, uh, that the whole room is filled with molasses. And so it takes us a very long time to clean up the room. So integrating the kind of uh, improvisation, pretend play, imaginary games um, into everyday activities can also sort of start getting you there if you don't have any theater background or theater training at all. But the key to all of this is the physical with the narrative. Yeah, the key to all of it really is that sort of like physical engagement with the world, right? So you're embodying the emotions and the actions and that there is some kind of character or narrative on top of it. And then also really important um, is that safe space, right? That idea that like, this is just play. This is just fun. This is consequence free. You can't say the wrong thing. You can't do the wrong thing. Um, you know, every way of walking around the room is the right way of walking around the room. Um, and we give people applause and we give them a uh, thumbs up for just for trying, right? It is the trying that matters here. Um, and then that gets shaped and molded as you get older and older, right? Certainly um, the idea of a fully consequence-free environment doesn't quite hold water in a school, right? There, there are limits on what you're allowed to do and allowed to say, but if you're just starting out, if you're just trying, um, it can be pretty open to however you want it to work. And your research really is against this backdrop of arts funding being cut all across the country. Um, on the one hand, we're having a national conversation about isolation and loneliness and soft skills. And then on the other hand, we're taking out the very programs that seem to help nurture these skills. So how can we leverage the research to rally for funding? And are there organizations that are doing that? that people need to support. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, of course, I didn't get into this work to do any sort of advocacy, right? My, my research and my interests are really based in um, sort of scientific curiosity and wanting to know more about this topic and wanting to understand it more deeply. Uh, but I think sort of naturally when you're involved in the arts, advocacy has to emerge because of the, what you just said, which is that um, the arts sort of, and theater in particular, uh, usually ends up being the first thing to be cut, right? As soon as a budget is squeezed, um, the first thing that's looked to is to the arts. Uh, and within the art forms, the first thing that's looked to is theater, right? The theater program is always going to be cut before the music program or the visual arts program. But the arts programs are always going to be cut before the sports programs, and they're always going to be cut before the math program or the reading program or, or what have you. Um, I think, you know, this is a really complicated question. I think it's a really sort of like, there are so many factors at play. There's factors at play all the way from the fact that it's easier to measure achievement in math and science than it is to measure achievement in theater and music, right? So it's hard to defend what you can't necessarily provide like a quick infographic um, of achievement on, although I'm trying, I've, I have infographics in some of my papers about the skills that are gained over time in, in theater. Um, I think a second part of it is that uh, because theater is so individualistic and because the arts are so individualistic, what is an important work of theater to you may not be an important work of theater to me. And so I think the conversations sometimes miss each other or skip each other uh, because some people may say, well, I love theater, but Shakespeare, I can't get into Shakespeare. So if it's Shakespeare, then what's the point of doing theater? Um, or, you know, I love, uh, I love a big Broadway musical, but these more sort of serious chamber musicals that are dealing with like mental illness, I don't want to, I don't want to spend my time and my money on that. Right. So I think the individualistic nature of theater is part of the reason why it's so exciting and why people love it. But also sometimes I think why it's harder to get a grip on. Um, I also think theater 
purposefully and for all time, Western theater um, is trying to get people to examine issues that they don't necessarily want to examine. So theater has always been sort of very, um, very much about uh, the boundaries of what we consider to be normalized and the boundaries of decorum. And all that to say, theater has a lot of work to do sort of within its own house, right? Particularly around issues of gender, um, issues of safety and issues of race um, and ethnicity um, and, and being racially inclusive beyond tokenization or radically inclusive beyond like the gender binary, for example. Um, there are strides being made but certainly there are differences between like more mainstream forms of theater and more um, like uh, I was going to say radical forms of theater, but also sort of more progressive forms of theater. So I think that also that part of the conversation makes it difficult because theater makers are often trying to make change um, and it requires time and space uh, in a way that um, you can teach math facts pretty quickly, uh, but theater, it might take a whole semester to, to put on one scene. Um, and that kind of goes against the rapid nature with which we expect our children to learn right now. Um, so I think that the sort of lack of testability, the ethos around inclusion, the ethos around speed um, and what achievement looks like. You know, I think I, I think all of these things, uh, the values that our education system is sometimes forced to uphold because of the constraints put upon it by various forces, make it much harder for theater to continue to be at the forefront of conversations. Um, I will say it's also, I think, we talk a lot in the science community about science communication and about being able to translate and communicate your science to a general audience. And when scientists can't communicate, the idea is like, oh, well, they really know what they're doing and that it, and I just don't understand. So people tend to put the burden on themselves when they can't understand what what a scientist is saying. But when a theater person tries to communicate and is perhaps struggling to communicate the importance of the work, I think people often externalize that to the theater person, right? And they say like, oh, well, you're not telling me the importance here and that's an issue with you and your communication skills. And so I don't have a solution to that. I don't have a strong idea of like how we can work to resolve that. Um, but I do think it's an issue to be thinking about and, and an issue where, um, you know, science, public communication techniques are are important and I think um, something for, for people to learn about. I think I've missed the second part of your question. I get really excited about all of these topics and can just talk at I length. I love it though, but it's so much food for thought, right? Because it, these are the things that, I, you know, a, a playwright and an artist who I love is Lauren Gunderson. And she really marries these ideas of science and art and how yes. they, um, the intersection of science and art. So I love like your, your research just takes that to a whole new level. I don't think Lauren would say she's a scientist, but, um, but, but it's part of that conversation of how do we communicate um, the, the values and the importance of art. And I think, you know, if we just look to the pandemic um, and how people really leaned into the arts yes. for survival <laughs> and connection, yes. um, you don't have to go much past that to see the value of art. Yeah, I think I think it's also about, um, you know, in in science and in philosophy of science, we often talk about ways of knowing. Right. And and how do you know about the world? How do you understand the world? And again, going back to your very first question about hard skills versus soft skills. Right. Hard skills are one way of knowing about the world, which is like facts and you know, these these sort of like blocks of information that you can sort of understand um, versus the sort of way of knowing about the world that is individualized and specific and dependent on the moment. And I think that way of knowing, right, and when we talk about things like indigenous ways of knowing or um, narrative ways of knowing, those ways of knowing are, are complex and take time. And um, 
go against sort of the neurological biases we have towards heuristics. So the brain wants shortcuts. The human brain wants shortcuts because it makes life easier. And frankly, if we didn't have shortcuts, we wouldn't be able to survive, right? If you had to fully pay attention to your route every single time you went from your home to your workplace, you wouldn't be able to do anything else at all, right? If you had to truly stop and consciously think about every word coming out of your mouth, like you do when you're first learning another language, it makes it very hard to do anything else. You sort of can't do that and eat at the same time, right? Um, you can't, it's, it's, you know, if you had to really think about cleaning your house while you were doing it, you wouldn't then be able to have a conversation, right? So this idea of heuristics and biases, shortcuts that the brain wants and needs to take in order to be able to exist in the world, that's what learning is, right? We learn how to ride a bike and then we can focus on other things. We learn how to, um, I don't know, wash dishes, and then we can focus on other things. So you learn, and then your brain sort of incorporates it, turns it into an unconscious processes. You don't have to pay so much attention to it. You can take those heuristic shortcuts, right? Theater forces you to examine process. Theater forces you to examine the long way around. Um, you know, packed answers, simple answers, um, straightforward answers. That's not what theater wants, right? That's not what theater makers want. That's not what artists want generally. And so there is a, a difficulty in getting people to engage, right? Like, and, and I think also there's this difference between theater and film and television in that you also have a live human with a live body standing in front of you. So all sorts of like autonomic person perception, right? Automatic ways of responding to other human bodies, because that's what we're evolved to do, get activated when you're in a room full of theater people and that do not necessarily get activated when you're in film or television uh, theaters, uh, because you're sort of watching the flattened screen. Again, this is why Zoom doesn't feel as good as an in-person meeting, right? Like, and being with your friends in person is better than being with them over Zoom. And it's because humans are meant to be in community. Humans are meant to be connected. Going all the way back to your point about like loneliness and isolation, right? Humans are meant to be in community. Absolutely. The, the research um, area of arts engagement, developmental psychology, it's, it, this is a fairly new field. So you have your book coming out, but where do we go from here? Yeah, so my hope is that um, the book is really meant to spur a new way of thinking about how we talk about learning from theater. Um, you know, the 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 research in the like 80s, 90s um, in developmental psychology and the arts was all about transfer, all about, well, if you learn visual arts, it makes you better at biology. If you learn music, it makes you better at math. If you learn theater, it makes you better at your English language subject test on the SATs. There's some evidence to support some of those claims. There's way more evidence to say that those claims are just not true, right? You 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 can't go take theater class and all of a sudden get an 800 on the like language part of your SATs. That's just not how learning works. Um, and the other argument against that is, well, if the arts make you better at math, you know what else makes you better at math? More math. And so in the end, it's still not an argument to put the arts into schools. It's just an argument that math is more important than the arts, just sort of packaged in a slightly different way. So that was a lot of the work of the, the 80s and 90s. Um, and then the work sort of into the 2000s and, and for the last 20 years or so has really been trying to get at this um, perspective of art for art's sake. And like, well, what is it that's inherent to the arts and what is it that is happening in the arts classroom? And, and how can we make the argument that the arts for themselves are really important? And now I think we're starting to see a bit of the pendulum swinging back, but I think into a better place, which is take the arts on their values for themselves and look for the ways in which they teach you to interact with the outside world, but not necessarily based on what the outside world thinks is the most important, but rather what the art form is actually training in itself. There's a great series 
series of books um, from Ellen Winner and Kimberly Sheridan, uh, Lois Hetland and Shirley Vanima called the Studio Thinking Books. And this is this perspective on the visual arts about what is actually happening in visual arts classrooms that is then possibly transferable to outside of the visual arts classrooms. What kind of skills and habits and, and abilities is it using, the visual arts classroom is using and integrating. And where that work has now gone is looking for elements in the classroom that lead to skills outside of the classroom based on that inherent knowledge in the classroom. And that's where I'm hoping this theater work will go. I'm hoping the theater work will spur teachers and advocates and researchers to look in those theater classrooms for, okay, this is a theater classroom um, that has these skills of flexibility and reflection and collaboration and communication and considering other people and body awareness like built into it how do we then look for the application of those skills in other fields in other domains in other situations we can go in of course and ask students like do you feel more aware of your body after having been in that class? And this is a first step, right? A first step is to say, do you think about problems more flexibly after being in that class? Are you more reflective on your activities after being in this theater class? But then the next step after that is to say, okay, well, flexibility and openness to experience is fundamentally necessary for creative thought. So if I teach you how to be flexible in an acting classroom, if I teach you to try something and it doesn't work, you move on to something else and it doesn't work, you try a different thing, you switch between tasks really quickly, and you're able to sort of come up with lots of ideas really fast. Then if, how can I teach you to take that theater-based skill and use it when you have to be creative in a coding classroom and use it when you have to be creative in another kind of classroom? in a way that the coding classroom cannot teach you itself, in a way that the, that the, that the um, science classroom, when you have to come up with your experiment, cannot teach you itself. What is it about the theater classroom and the theater way of creativity, the theater way of making decisions, the theater way of choosing um, collaboration or choosing communication that then can prep you, prime you, start you off in approaching the rest of your academic domains in that way. Um, and then I think critically importantly, uh, let us not forget that having fun and enjoyment and motivation and joy is also an antidote to loneliness and isolation, um, is also a way to form social supports and relationships. And those things are integral to a theater classroom. In every Every classroom that I watched for my book, every piece of data I collected for my book, students were laughing, they were smiling, they were showing up on time, they were joyful, they were playful. We don't have enough of that. And, and I know it's sort of a cheesy argument to like make the argument from the perspective of joy, but you know, we talk about sort of resiliency and positive psychology and inherent in resiliency and positive psychology is positive mood, right? Is happiness, is positive senses of emotion. And you need the full emotional range to live a full emotional life, right? All of the emotions are valid and all of the emotions are important. But finding pathways to joy and finding pathways to motivation and finding pathways to engagement is one of the ways in which students are going to be able to thrive through this sort of rapidly changing landscape of education and rapidly changing landscape of like jobs and life preparation. So I think the joy and the engagement and the motivation that theater provides, I think unpacking those elements is also gonna be really important going forward. I love this conversation. I feel like you and I could talk for 12 hours about this topic because I it's so absolutely would want to do days, that. days and days and days because yes. I just feel like there's so much to unpack. Yes. <laughs> there's so much to unpack, which is absolutely. why I'm excited about your book because then I can hold it in my hands and unpack it and really digest it because I feel like there's just so much to to the knowledge and it will be very personal for each person reading your book, which is what's so exciting. I so it comes out in July, right? So what yeah, is so it called so I can tell everybody? <laughs> so it's a, 
available for pre-order now. So you can get it now on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Bookshop or Teachers College Press, which is the, the publisher, Columbia University Teachers College Press. And the book is called Why Theater Education Matters understanding the cognitive, social, and emotional benefits. Um, and you can find all the details on my website, which is why theater, ed, I'm sorry, the website is uh, theateredmatters.com. Um, or you can just Google me Talia Goldstein and I, taliagoldstein.com. Um, so that website it's Friday, March 8th right now. That website will be live by April 1st. Um, you can pre-order the book now wherever you want to. Uh, and the book comes out July 26th. So why theater ed matters and theatered matters.com uh, is the, the best place to find all of it.